Hello and welcome back to The Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be jumping headfirst into the meat and potatoes of the Negan saga, and even already getting into some of All Out War. TV only folks, buckle up, because this one is absolutely wild for reasons which will become clear very very shortly. But let's not waste any more time and jump right in. Before we get to the follow-up with Lil Carl's mission, Let's quickly tackle all the TV ad and plot lines that are interwoven here. First off, Rick and Aaron go on a supply run because they're concerned with their supply situation and fear that their payment to Negan may not be sufficient. This is a remix from the book where the Alexandrians would tell Negan that Rick is on a supply run while, in reality, he had gone to meet with Ezekiel to discuss their rebellion against Negan. But aside from that connection, this entire boating adventure is a TV show exclusive. And personally, I think this was one of the most successful subplots in these couple of episodes, mostly because of its novelty and its importance. As much as I prefer the snappier form of rising up against Negan in the book, when it comes to the show, I think this little excursion with Aaron also did a lot to convince Rick that life under Negan is no life at all. And also, the whole dude living on a lake is a fairly classic apocalypse trope that we hadn't really seen yet. And I love myself some creative survivor methods, so this was a big win in my opinion. Another totally new addition is basically everything surrounding Michonne. In short, nothing even remotely close to this happens, and to me, I think this was a fairly weak and fillery feeling addition. I do suppose that from a character perspective, this was very much consistent for Michonne, but in the episode's overall narrative, I can't help but feel like it was merely removing all the heavy hitters from Alexandria that might otherwise cause problems with Negan's second visit. Though again, that might just be me. But with that said, we'll cover the rest of the remixes as we get to them, but now, let us return to our boy Carl. When we left off the book, we had just caught up to him going into the sanctuary alone, with no one having a clue that he has done that. And this is really where the fun part begins. In the book, the saviors open up the back of the truck and Carl just begins unloading on them. Negan, obviously, starts yelling out in his super colorful language, but Carl says that he only wants him. Negan, however, responds that Carl scares him. Though, when he once again begins spraying with the rifle, he is literally knocked to the ground by the recoil, following which he's immediately attacked by Dwight. But Negan yells out right away for Dwight to stop hitting a helpless kid. We'll get to this a lot more in a second, but as much as Negan is obviously a heartless psycho, he does have a soft spot for Carl and kids in general. So hold that thought for now. In the show on the other hand, Carl does basically the same exact thing, which would be great. Only it makes far less sense because plot armor, am I right? Remember that in the book, he immediately began spraying and just got knocked down because, well, he's tiny. He shot the dudes, asked to see Negan, and when Negan appeared, literally the next panel tried shooting again, but he couldn't. Maybe the recoil isn't terribly realistic, but to me, it's passable when it comes to selling these events. Well, in the show, that obviously doesn't work. Carl was spraying with a rifle as far back as Season 4. So, when Negan walks out, he just magically loses all will to shoot despite literally just shooting a bunch of them already, and so he calmly listens to Negan's monologue. For me, The Walking Dead has always walked a very, very fine line between realism and full-blown fiction, in that it is based in reality, but let's be real, it takes many creative liberties for the sake of the story that really aren't grounded in any reality whatsoever. Well, in cases like this, I think that suspension of disbelief is broken because Negan's plot armor is so blatantly clear that you'll actually be screaming at the screen. I feel like this issue is never as outwardly visible in the book just because of the medium. That suspension of disbelief is, by default, much more pronounced when you're reading things on paper rather than seeing them acted out by flesh and blood real people. So in this case, I also think there's an element of that uncanny valley, where it is both trying to come off as realistic while still being extremely comic booky. But yeah, point is, this is one of many instances in the show, many of which we'll be talking about plenty more in the future, that gave Negan some extremely noticeable plot armor which I think soured many honest characters right from the get-go. 
As for the rest of the visits, they too are extremely similar, almost one-to-one -one in many cases, even down to the dialogue. The only major differences stem from the pacing and the obvious difference in Carl's character. Number one, obviously the show just extends some scenes, adds a few lines of dialogue here and there, etc. But more importantly, we cut around to various different subgroups. Again, this is one of those instances where I'm clearly biased because I know the source material, but to me, the visit in the book was absolutely anxiety-inducing. The fact that we were just dropped in the middle of Negan's compound, following Carl of all people literally four issues after Negan was introduced, was simply nuts. Whereas in the show, I feel like that shock value was lessened both because we had already seen Dwight and Daryl in the sanctuary, so it didn't feel nearly as foreign, as well as the fact that we don't just continuously follow Carl. I just think that by not following through with these scenes, that uneasiness that was continuously building as we get deeper and deeper into Negan's compound, wasn't as impactful as it could have been if it was one uninterrupted scene. And of course, don't misunderstand me, I don't mean that this should have been like a single take, single shot type deal. I'm just saying that we shouldn't have cut away from Negan's compound to, for example, Rick. Though number two, it's the elephant in the room, Carl. I think I've beaten this talking point to death at this point, but there's just no way around it. A 17 year old being substituted for a 9 or 10 year old just feels odd. Especially because the dialogue is essentially identical. For example, the scene where Carl is forced to remove his eye patch. Obviously hearing Negan say that it's disgusting and all that would hurt anyone of any age, especially if you were already super insecure about it. But him doing that to a 10 year old just feels far more cruel and makes Carl's entire narrative arc feel that much more believable. Same goes for the song. When the episode originally came out, many, many people said, oh, it was cringy or whatever, but I think that's missing the entire point. It was literally meant to make you uncomfortable. The only difference is, if this was a 10-year-old who we already knew had gone through hell beforehand, it's not just uncomfortable, it's downright horrific. It's very difficult to capture the tone of this entire situation, and I just don't want to start another lengthy debate here. But with absolutely each and every scene that Carl is involved, it almost feels uncanny to see it adapted so faithfully, because it just feels off. The subtle angles like Carl's morbid curiosity about the sanctuary and how Negan operates is also mostly missing, which would be of vital importance later in the book. And as a result of all of those changes, Carl actually no longer wearing the eye patch later felt like a massive step toward him becoming even more cold. Whereas in the show, it just felt like a series of moments with no real underlying meaning. I do admit, quite a bit of my negative attitude here could just be because we never got to see the through lines of these scenes followed up in the show, because, well, Carl is dead. But regardless, I think you could genuinely write an entire thesis about how two nearly identical scenes can totally differ so, so massively. Because to me at least, this is genuinely night and day. Alright, before we get too caught up in the weeds, the rest of the visit generally goes down identically. We see Negan iron the dude's face, we see more Negan shenanigans, and that's basically the end of that. Though most importantly, in the book, Negan is just cut off as he says that he has plans for Carl, and we never see them again. And it's at this point where the one-to-one -one adaptations just stop, because in the show, Negan simply takes Carl back to Alexandria, which of course sets up the mid-season finale. But this is a heavy remix from the book, where things take a very, very different turn. Remember that in the show, Rick went out on a supply run. Well, in the books, he was the one to discover that Carl is missing, so clearly, they immediately mounted a search to find him. Soon thereafter, Jesus would show up in the middle of the night, which is where the scene of him waking up Rick and Michonne is taken from, and tells Rick that he found Negan and that he heard a rifle spraying in their courtyard. Rick puts two and two together and figures that since one of their rifles just went missing, Carl must have snuck onto the truck, so with that, Rick immediately calls on his closest allies and they set off for the sanctuary. As Rick would explain, his plan here wasn't to start anything. There was no intention to fight or anything. He merely planned on showing up at Negan's gates to basically say, Hey, I know where you sleep, but I'll play nice. 
As he himself would say, Negan doesn't want to fight either, so if he plays nice, so will Negan. Only problem is, they don't get terribly far before running into Negan himself. And I know some of you are likely sick of hearing this by now, but I think this is super important for giving you a sense of how different the story feels. This is just issue 106 and 107. And with that in mind, let's get into their conversation. As you'd expect at this point, Negan cheerfully gets out of his truck and says, Oh well, how convenient, I was just on my way to see you. Though when Rick responds that he was also on his way to see him, Negan is a little surprised because they were actually headed in the right direction, obviously knowing full well that Rick is also making moves. Though he then drops the bombshell. I can't f wait until you see what I've done to your little boy. And oh man, I will never forget reading this line for the first time. Remember what I said about Negan's speech to Carl? It was cut off. We literally had no clue what he did. And again, we met Negan six issues ago, and he was clearly the most messed up bad guy to date, so we had zero clue what he might do. And the best part? This was the last panel of the issue, so we were left stewing on this for an entire month. And then Kirkman, being the cheeky little man that he is, releases this cover. Like, bro, why? Though, as you'd expect, the next issue opens up with Rick already headbutting Negan and just going all out against him. And moments later, all masks are off and Rick is just not holding back at all, even biting him when Negan starts to choke him. Obviously, Negan too says that he's not going to let someone like Rick beat him down in front of his men, so he too throws a few good punches and asks whether Rick has lost his marbles even starting something like this. And the worst part, when the fight is heating up, Negan even throws in the phrase of you're going to regret this in a few minutes, clearly evoking the lineup. Though, just as soon as the fight began, Negan throws Rick to the ground, tells everyone to stand down, and reminds them that they still haven't been slaughtered. And then we see Carl walk out perfectly fine. To which Negan calmly says, poor choice of words, I admit. I should have said, I can't wait for you to see that I've done nothing to your little boy. And then adding, yeah, I was instigating you, but I never thought you'd take the bait so easily. And before we move any further, can you see why I've been going on so, so much about how different the tone is? For those who haven't read the books, can you even imagine a scene like this going down even before the mid-season finale? I'll just leave that question in the air, but things don't end there. We of course see Rick immediately go to hug Carl, though Negan butts in and recounts the events, saying that he showed up in his home and gunned down his men. Continuing by saying that he's not like that. He brought Carl here safe and sound. His speech does go on for a little bit longer, but he finishes by saying that he didn't become this powerful by going around and killing everyone, and that he has zero intention of doing anything to them. Saying this is more than enough to prove that fact. If Rick cooperates, he will as well. And despite Rick honestly telling him that he doesn't believe him for a second, Negan still takes that as a win because, hey, Rick is technically cooperating, so that is that. And he also of course adds the line, I take no joy in those deeds. Lucille, on the other hand, thankfully she's not in charge. And with all that, Negan reminds them that he'll be back in a few days for their next payment, and they set off. I do admit, in hindsight, it seems pretty obvious that he wouldn't do anything to Carl, but man, did this entire sequence have me at the edge of my seat. I still remember thinking that the whole, your eye socket looks cool, could be hinting at the fact that he took out his other eye too. And then for us to get Rick and Negan legit throw down only for Carl to walk out perfectly fine, man, was that a subversion of expectations in the best way possible. And right on the heels of that, we get another very interesting conversation between Rick and Jesus. Where Rick immediately just asks, All of that was complete <coughs> right? But Jesus responds, Actually no, his rules and methods may be weird, but if you follow them, you'll be fine. I don't know whether this is just a me thing, but I always felt like this was much more true for the comic version of Negan. As we've seen and will continue seeing in the show, 
he is actively trying to handicap them. Whereas in the book, it almost felt like he legitimately didn't care what they did so long as they got their supplies. And considering the fact that Negan's introduction was already far, far more polarizing in the show, I think it's no surprise that many grew to absolutely despise Negan, while in the book, he was far more reasonable and likable. Don't get me wrong, he was still a terrible dude in both, but he was still likable even as a bad guy. Feel free to chime in on this, especially if you've gone through both versions yourself. And because the order of events is somewhat remixed here for the sake of simplicity, let's cover everything leading up to Negan's second visit in the book as well. Following their entire encounter with Carl, Rick addresses Alexandria basically repeating what he said last time. They are working with Negan and he is clearly reasonable considering he never laid a finger on Carl. Again, this is just keeping up appearances and he has zero intention of living under Negan for much longer. Which brings us on to the debrief between Rick, Andrea and Jesus. Rick shares some of the stuff that Carl told him, most notably that it's not just fighters living in the sanctuary and the fact that they are seemingly low on ammunition. So with more and more intel mounting, they see an opportunity to strike back, which is when Jesus says that it's time for Rick to meet Ezekiel. This was of course remixed for the show in that we've already seen the kingdom with Morgan and Carol, but it hasn't been properly introduced through the survivors themselves. So in a way, it is both moved earlier and also later at the same time. But with that, Rick and Jesus are escorted into the kingdom where they meet King Ezekiel. And, basically right away, they begin talking about allying up against Negan. Ezekiel even calls out Gregory for being a coward, and says that it is great to meet someone who is willing to rebel against Negan's tyranny. Though just as they get to talking about exactly how such an alliance might look like, Dwight walks in saying that he knows full well Rick doesn't want to see him, but that he is also in full support in rising up against Negan. And while Rick immediately yells out that he is lying, Dwight explains that he didn't even know Rick was aware that the kingdom existed, and that he is here simply because he always knew Ezekiel was the only one with guts to make a move against Negan. Their exchange goes back and forth for a bit, but point is, Dwight says that Negan has his wife and that's why he wants to take him down. Also saying that because of everything that has happened with him and Sherry, he got his face burned. So with that, a somewhat flimsy alliance does appear to be on the cards. This video is brought to you by, well, no one really, just me, you watching, and our glorious patrons. Do you wish these retrospectives would come out faster? Well, yeah, unfortunately me too. And to make the wait a little less daunting, feel free to check out my Twitch where I sometimes ramble on about anything to do with the Walking Dead universe. And if that doesn't quite meet your fancy, I've also started posting edited down streams to my second channel, where I've already ranked all the TV universe seasons in a almost two hour long video. I plan on ranking all the comic volumes soon, so stay tuned for that. And with that said, back to the video. Before we follow up with them, we cut over to the hilltop where we get a short check in with Maggie. Similar to what we talked about last time with episode 5, we see that Maggie is changing the hilltop's traditions and generally getting along with everyone fairly well. Though suddenly, Jesus pops up saying that Rick sent him. He then explains that a rebellion is slowly mounting and that he needs to make sure the hilltop will also stand behind the joint alliance. Obviously, Gregory screams and shouts that there's no way that is happening, but Jesus makes it pretty clear that it is indeed happening. He then goes to talk to Cal, one of the Hilltop's lookouts, to discuss how this entire fight might go down. The only problem is, he doesn't seem to be exactly on board, asking what suddenly changed. Before we follow up with them, we cut to Alexandria for a second, but for the sake of simplicity, let's tackle the Hilltop first. We then cut to Jesus introducing Maggie to Earl, the Hilltop's blacksmith. They generally banter around for a bit, but then Jesus asks, where did Cal go? And when Earl answers that he said he'd walk the perimeter, Jesus realizes that he betrayed them and ran off to warn the saviors. He immediately goes after him and finds him fairly quickly. The only problem is, Cal had already called the saviors. And as they arrive to receive his message, Jesus does manage to talk them out of the situation, saying that they just wanted to warn them that their next payment would be a little light. So, they give Jesus a nice punch for disturbing them nine days in advance and just leave. 
Though, if I'm being honest, this entire little scare does seem a little bit convenient in the sense that it's just a surprise for the sake of having a cliffhanger where Jesus realizes he's been betrayed. There's no grand story change or anything like that, it is basically just setting up a cliffhanger that doesn't really amount to anything. It does sort of convey the entire message of the hilltop where people are genuinely scared to fight back, but in the grand scheme of things, again, it doesn't really change anything. Be honest with yourself, if we saw this sort of thing happen in the show, there'd be torches and pitchforks because hey, clearly it is filler, right? Anyway, now back at Alexandria, Rick basically makes it official that a battle is on the horizon and they begin talking strategy with Andrea. Though importantly, when Carl walks in saying that he heard them talking, Rick cuts him off saying, Good, I was just coming to get you. Obviously implying that he finally sees him as grown up enough to know what's going on. Or maybe he just thinks that if Carl actually knows what's happening, he won't try to pull another Negan assassination. But whatever the intention, point is, he is looped in on the plan. Following this, Rick once again makes the rounds to his closest allies and begins explaining everything that has happened since. Essentially just coming clean about all the lies and saying that he always intended to fight back. Obviously, some aren't exactly thrilled to hear that Rick led them on the entire time, but things are moving along and Rick plans to get everyone ready to head back to the kingdom for another debrief. But before they set off, Spencer pops in and basically calls out Rick for his leadership on absolutely all fronts. This is of course just further setting up what will happen during Negan's visit, so for now, it ends there. And with all that out of the way, the group once again packs up to head back to the kingdom. After they arrive, obviously everyone is once again surprised by the almost caricature that is Ezekiel, but most importantly, we get the much anticipated meeting between Michonne and Ezekiel. You see, when you have two characters who use swords, the very laws of the universe would dictate that at some point in time, they have to cross said swords. And because Kirkman very much respects these laws, that is literally one of the first things we see. But of course, with Ezekiel being the legend that he is, he just says, I simply wanted to see if mine was bigger. It was not. Though with the introductions out of the way, they throw a banquet and things are rapidly moving ahead with Dwight supposedly already slipping back into the Savior's ranks to assassinate Negan and to give the Alliance an opening to quickly put an end to this conflict. And before we move on, the aforementioned sword-wielding duo have another interesting conversation. Put briefly, the entire conversation is basically lifted identically for the one that Carol and Ezekiel has, and in many ways, Michonne in this coming arc is very similar to the TV Carol. Both aren't quite sure how they fit into the world, both are burned with relationships, and so on. And they also call each other out for playing a king and a samurai, which is of course a bit on the nose for us as the reader as well. Though after their brief scuffle and not exactly friendly attitude toward one another, they agree to start their whole relationship anew. This will be relevant later on, so just keep that in mind for now. We then see everyone basically getting ready for what comes next. We see the people in the kingdom begin packing, others practicing shooting, others practicing swordplay, and so on. We also see all the big hitters meet up in the kingdom to discuss exactly what their next move is. Basically, put very, very briefly, things are rapidly heating up. The only problem is, Rick and Alexandria still have to make their payments, which is when we cut back to Alexandria and Negan knocking at the gates. And with that said, let us finally return to the show, where Negan just takes Carl to Alexandria with no extra drama added. And since in both versions Rick is not in Alexandria, Negan basically just decides to stick around and wait for a bit. Similar to Negan's first visits, much of the dialogue and events are lifted right from the book, though they are also very different at the same time. Most of all, and hold on to your pants if you haven't read the book, this is where the war begins. And in case you've forgotten the episode order, this is only episode 7 and 8. So yeah, you can see how the latter half of the season will be very, very interesting. But let's not rush ahead just yet. In the show, we do get a couple absolutely excellent additions though. First off, the scene that has been memed into oblivion. Don't just... care. Where's Rick? Now that the Rick and Michonne spin-off is announced, the joke will probably disappear for a while, 
but man, was it a solid meme while the movies were still in the quote-unquote pre-production stage. Literally every single bit of Walking Dead news that drops just had this video in the replies. It was glorious. Number two, the entire spaghetti story is simply brilliant. I will legit never forget that scene of Carl just making whatever that's supposed to be. Sure, it doesn't look like pasta, but whatever. Negan in an apron just looks like the most dystopian thing ever. And then the whole... Man, I fed him spaghetti. ...is just the cherry on top. And lastly, the montage of Negan once again just having the time of his life in Alexandria is just excellent. Though in the midst of all this, we of course still have Daryl back at the Sanctuary, who's also planning his escape. Again, since no characters were ever taken prisoner, this entire sequence is an add-in for the show. But the biggest thing here is of course him going ham on Fat Joey and getting Rick's revolver back. Which would also later prompt Negan to have a moment of silence, because... Without Fat Joey, Skinny Joey is just... Joey. Though returning to Alexandria, we finally get to the first major climax in the Negan saga. Most of which is fueled by the very hateable Spencer. In both versions, he just essentially tries getting buddy-buddy with Negan and tries convincing him that Rick is more bad than good for their agreements. Negan, being the friendly guy that he is, obviously entertains this idea a little. And here, I have to give massive props to whoever came up with the idea of pushing up Negan's pool table talk and actually having them play it. Because the entire sequence just screams classic bad guys playing pool. It's a trope, but I love it. And even if you hadn't read the books and didn't know what was coming, I think the uneasiness in this scene is very, very clear. Though when it comes to the whole it takes guts moment, all of that is adapted basically word for word. Including Negan doing his whole, oh wow, they were inside you the entire time spiel. Though here too the TV version did change a few things. Because in the book, he literally just guts him and goes off to chill on the porch. They weren't playing the pool, so there's no audience behind them or anything like that. It was just the two of them on the streets. Whereas in the show, we see Rosita try to shoot him, hit Lucille, which prompts them to shoot Olivia in retaliation. And on top of that, Negan recognizes that the bullet is a homemade one and also takes Eugene with him. The whole shooting Lucille thing does actually happen later in the book, so we'll get to that in due time. As for Rick's arrival, before we get into the story, I am like 99% sure that the whole I'm losing my voice thing is complete improv by JDM and that scene was just excellent. We had an agreement, Rick! <sighs> Your people are making me lose my voice doing all this yelling. That slight bit of very raw realism mixed in just elevated a lot in my opinion. It's a small detail, but I really appreciated it. Though in story, Rick returns and similar to everything we've seen already, he is shook. And while he does tell Negan to leave, broadly speaking, Rick doesn't really try anything at all. And while yes, I do admit, the entire sequence of Rick just standing in front of the pool table is a cinematic masterpiece, when it comes to the story, there is absolutely no contest for me that I prefer the book, so let's get to that. After Negan got Spencer, Rick rushes in and begins screaming at Negan, saying that they had an agreement and openly calling him out for killing one of their own. And as if that wasn't enough, after Negan asks for a thank you, Rick straight up tells him, explain yourself or your men don't leave this place alive. Negan does calm down a little bit and starts explaining the entire situation. Basically telling Rick that Spencer was going to backstab him and that next time he sees something like this happen, he wouldn't be as nice as to help Rick out. Though, it does not end there. We then see Negan and Rick walk over to the RV where they have the supplies from the kingdom and the hilltop. And while Negan commands his men to load it up, Rick once again interrupts him and says that the deal was half. Negan tries saying, but well, what about the trader payments? Rick still repeats half and just walks off. And it's then that everything goes haywire. Because he straight up sprints home to get Andrea and begins to set up an ambush. Once again saying, Negan's not leaving here alive. And no more than a few panels later, a shot goes straight through the truck's window and gets Negan's driver. 
The Alexandrians, believing that Negan only brought the eight dudes, surround Negan and Rick asks, You ever hear the one about the guy who brought a baseball bat to a gunfight? And as he pulls the trigger, it's not Negan who is shot. Instead, all of the Alexandrians get either their hands or guns shot. Which is when Negan pulls the reverse Uno, asking Rick whether he really thought organizing these supply runs takes such a long time for just eight guys, revealing that he has had armed backup this entire time. And this line basically sums up the entire situation. He calls out Rick for using bullets for the dead, saying that they save them for situations like this. And he then adds that everything that Rick thought about them not having firearms was because they're designated for the quote-unquote thinkers. And to wrap this entire situation up, we just get a splash panel of Negan's men revealing themselves as Negan concludes his speech by saying that all of this takes a lot of scheduling. And because this is just the beginning of this entire craziness, that's where we'll leave it for now. There's a ton ton more to talk about and we've still got the TV version to catch up on, so I don't want to jumble up everything here at the very very end. Once again, I think you can see why I said that season 7 and 8 are an absolute doozy when it comes to these comparisons, as episodes 8 and 16 are basically the same issue. And the number of subtle differences that make this whole thing drastically different should also be pretty clear by now. And since you've made it here, please do let me know which version you prefer now that you've heard at least a summary of what happens. Because just to re-emphasize, the war should have technically begun in episode 8. Obviously the order of events would have been swapped around because Rick still hasn't even met Ezekiel. But hey, I mean all of that could have just been replaced with the Oceanside episode. So yeah, if this is your first time ever hearing of the comic book events, do let me know what you think. Genuinely, I am curious. Though, with that said, next time we'll be delving into the back half of Season 7, talking about one of, if not the most controversial groups in the entirety of the Walking Dead franchise, and beginning to delve into early All Out War. And that's the video. Just one more left in Season 7 and then we're moving right on to the even more controversial Season 8 and All Out War. Though with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Tristan and Flailing Tools. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye